You're watching Eye on Africa here on France 24. I'm Julie Kim, and these are the headlines on the continent. French troops join a manhunt in Niger to root out those responsible for the killing of eight people. Most of them were French nationals. Anti-terrorism prosecutors in Paris have also opened an investigation. Schools reopen in DR Congo after a four-month shutdown due to coronavirus. Our correspondents bring us the latest from Kinshasa. And an Algerian court sentences journalist Khaled Rani to three years in prison for his coverage of last year's pro-democracy protests. Rights groups call the decision absurd and a travesty of justice. Let's go first to Niger, where troops backed by French fighter jets are hunting down the gunman who killed eight people on Sunday. The bodies of six French and two Nigerian nationals were found at a giraffe sanctuary, widely considered to be a safe zone in the country. Meanwhile, in Paris, anti-terrorism prosecutors have opened a formal investigation. Most of the victims worked for the French NGO Acted. Their killing has been condemned as cowardly by the leaders of France and Niger. Nicolas Germain reports. This was the car that belonged to the NGO Acted. It was found in the Kouré region southeast of the capital Niamey. The driver and a guide were from Niger. The six humanitarian workers were French. All were killed by an armed group. The victims had come here to observe giraffes. The army and forensics are on site. This man is the uncle of the deceased guide. He spoke to him just before the attack. In Paris, the NGO Act had gave a press conference it stressed that its employees had not gone to a red zone. They are the areas which the French government advises against visiting. La zone de visite, etc., est une zone où, classiquement, toute la communauté internationale basée à Miami va le week-end. Euh, comité international, diplomate, que sais-je, et qui, jusqu'à présent et jusqu'à hier, n'avait connu aucun incident de sécurité. French anti-terror prosecutors said they would investigate charges of murders with links to a terrorist enterprise. It's the first attack targeting Westerners in this area southeast of Niamey. The region has attracted tourists for two decades, ever since it became a sanctuary for rare West African giraffes. Most of the jihadist attacks in Niger take place north of the capital, in the area called the Three Frontiers, along the borders of Niger, Mali and Burkina Faso. Well, earlier we spoke to Andrew Leibovich, a policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. I started by asking him who might be responsible for the attack. For most observers, uh, there has been suspicion on the Islamic State in the, in the Greater Sahara. Um, and it seems, at least with the mode of attack, that this is, a, this is a strong possibility, but we really have to wait for more information before we can say anything definitive. Now, the first attack, it's the first attack on Western tourists um, in what had been regarded as a safe zone in the country. Why do you think we're seeing this progressive erosion of the security situation in Niger and in the Sahel re region more widely? Well, there are a couple of factors that are very important to keep in mind. Uh, the first is, of course, that security in the region has been uh, has been worsening for years now. So this is not a exactly new phenomenon. And even in Niger... Um, one of the things that's, that's been uh, particular about Niger is that there have been a number of attacks over the years, uh, either in or near Niamey, or not all that far from Niamey, uh, if we think even of the border. Um, the attacks are, are much closer to Niamey than, for instance, the attacks in Mali are to Bamako, uh, the capital generally. So there's been a, a bit of an exception, but not much of one. But we've seen I think, a spread of insecurity in different areas in Niger, not just near the border with Mali, but also along the border with Burkina Faso, and then, of course, further down toward the border with Nigeria. So this this has, I think, been building for some time, and unfortunately, we're seeing the result now. Now, the G5 Sahel and France's own Barkhan uh, forces have uh, failed to root out extremists and militants in the Sahel so far. Have they overpromised? It's not so much a question of overpromising as this is an incredibly challenging set of circumstances. Um, and when we're talking about not just uh, diverse and complicated local contexts, but also the fact that 
these attacks are happening sometimes uh, over very spread out areas where even French forces uh, have limited resources and their ability, they cannot respond everywhere. And Nigerian forces also, of course, uh, cannot respond everywhere. Um, but this is going to, I think, likely lead to at least not just increased security measures, uh, but potentially some reconsideration of how Nigerian and international forces are positioned and how they go about coordinating and trying to uh, prevent further attacks like this. Well, moving on now, a Japanese ship that ran aground on a reef of Mauritius has now stopped leaking oil into the sea. But the Mauritian prime minister has warned that the tanker will break apart and the country must brace for a worst-case scenario. Over the past fortnight, more than 1,000 litres of fuel has polluted its eastern coast, blackening its coral reefs and pristine lagoons. Conservationists are sounding the alarm amid reports of dead fish and oil-covered seabirds. Meanwhile, Mauritians are making floating barriers out of leaves and human hair as part of the massive cleanup effort. Well, it's back to school for the pupils of DR Congo after a four-month closure due to coronavirus. Final year students were allowed back in classrooms this Monday to prepare for end-of-year exams. President Felix Chisikedi visited some facilities in the capital, Kinshasa. He urged teachers and students to follow guidelines to avoid catching and spreading the virus. Our team on the ground reports. Primary schools, secondary schools and universities in DR Congo were initially scheduled to reopen on the 3rd of August, but the move was delayed because of technical and administrative reasons. That extra week was actually needed to implement a number of sanitary and hygiene measures, this to protect students and teachers, and of course to prevent the spread of coronavirus. The conditions are not reunies at 100%, but we have the minimum qui nous permet euh, de, de respecter les mesures sanitaires. Notamment, Notamment euh, le, 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 prendre la température, euh, lavage de mains à l'entrée de, de, de l'école. For teachers and students, it's now a race against the clock to make up for lost time. Schools were closed back in March and many children have been unable to study at home. They now have less than a month to prepare for end-of-year exams. Nous avons allongé un peu les journées. Et nous avons synthétisé les matières pour que tout se passe un peu d'une manière rapide parce que nous devons rattraper le temps. Selon moi, un mois, ça, me suffit, ça ne suffira pas. Oui, parce que c'est vraiment trop serré, les programmes sont trop serrés. While students headed back to schools, thousands of teachers were on strike this Monday. Some even took to the streets across the country to complain about their working conditions. Young recruits in particular say they haven't been paid in months. The education minister says he will meet with teachers' unions later this week. Well, as schools reopen in the DR Congo, Malawi has shot bars and churches to curb the spread of coronavirus. All public gatherings have been banned and the wearing of face masks have become mandatory. The move comes three months after a court blocked the government from imposing a full lockdown. Since the first positive case was detected back in early April, confirmed infections have nearly doubled over the past four weeks. The country has recorded over 4,600 cases and over 150. 40 deaths so far. Not even received prior uh, notice about the, the development of these new rules and regulations. For that reason, uh, we express our displeasure. But law is law, and it must be adhered to. The government has put uh, good ideas in order to combat the spread of the coronavirus. Honorable business is we end and finally, Algerian journalist Khaled Rani has been handed a three-year prison sentence for his coverage of last year's pro-democracy protests. He was convicted of inciting unauthorized demonstrations and attacking national unity. But the sentencing has caused outrage among activists and rights groups who are calling for more international pressure on the Algerian government. Karis Garland has the story. Covering pro-democracy protests in Algeria, Khaled Rani said he was just exercising his right to inform, but on Monday an Algerian court sentenced him to three years in prison and a fine of more than 300 euros. His lawyer labelled the ruling unjust. 
نحن مسؤولين ومتفاجئين جدا بهذا الحكم الذي نعتبره بانه قاسي ولا يستند لقانون لاي قانون وطبعا سنقوم باستئناف باستئناف هذا الحكم The 40-year-old was arrested in March on charges of inciting an unarmed gathering and endangering national unity. Two co-accused in the trial, both protesters, were sentenced to two years each. Reporters Without Borders said the Algerian regime was sending a message to journalists telling them they can't act freely. Khaled will from now on be a symbol, a symbol of this authoritarian regime in Algeria. The President Tebboune uh, the current Algerian president promised that there would be a new Algeria, a democratic Algeria. This is exactly the contrary. Protests that began in February last year called for the removal of the current political class and an end to corruption. They pushed former president Abdelaziz Bouteflika to step down in April 2019 and continued after Abdelmajid Tebboune succeeded him in December. The demonstrations were brought to a halt only by the coronavirus outbreak earlier this year. Well, you're all up to date. There's more news coming up up ahead. Uh, stay tuned to France 24.